Oh, well, good morning. Uh, another one of my my videos. But anyway, um, I guess uh, there are a number of things that uh, I'd like to put down in film, let's say, or ideas and, and things that I want to be uh, pursuing that, to a certain degree anyway in the coming months or who knows, the next year or two. And uh, as a, uh, a rail enthusiast, I have a few ideas that uh, I'd like to see rail preservation groups or even state governments actually uh, consider. Uh, and I guess some people would say they might be fanciful or, you know, daydreaming or call it what pipe dreams, whatever you like to call it. But um, I do believe that um, some of my ideas are quite viable and worthy of uh, introduction. And uh, as I have said over uh, well over 30 years, of, um, uh, I've been doing transport lobby work since the early 80s. Uh, none of the ideas that I put up uh, are actually uh, pie in the sky. They're, they're actually well worthwhile considering. Uh, and with that lobbying work, I'll be hopefully submitting something towards uh, the Queensland Rail, or more importantly, I suppose, uh, the new Minister for Transport, um, Scott Emerson. I hope to be able to set up a meeting with him or, or with his Director General and put a submission in regarding Queensland Rail. Uh, but right now, uh, I would um, be thinking of things like, uh, I, I got a message from a friend in, in England and uh, and he uh, will be travelling behind that uh, uh, locomotive, uh, the uh, tornado, in the coming months. And that, as many enthusiasts are aware, that locomotive is actually a, a virtual, and an exact replica uh, of um, the A1 class uh, locomotives. And uh, it obviously cost in the millions of dollars to build. Now, I wouldn't be suggesting anything like that for Australia, although it would be nice, but I think it will never occur. What is far more viable in Australia are a couple of concepts. Uh, one of them I'd like to see done is a, make a replica of the old um, AEC uh, rail cars that used to operate in Victoria. And I'm thinking uh, in particular of one they called the Beetle at the time. It used to run uh, on the line uh, up, up to uh, Summerton in, in the outer suburbs of Melbourne, uh, from Faulkner actually, but it's on the upfield line, in other words, is now electrified, that was part of it. Uh, something like that could be built for, not to say relatively cheap, but fairly cheap by comparison to the steam locomotive, of course. And you could virtually build almost an exact replica of something like that and I believe it would be a uh, useful uh, thing to have in other words it would be a, a, a draw tourism uh, if an outer, outer suburban line could get that service uh, provided by a replica AEC you could perhaps use an AEC bus motor from roughly the period I mean uh, there would be still a few uh, of that type of uh, engine um, available and if not an AEC engine or something related as close as you can, uh, you know, even perhaps even a more modern version of an engine would be fitted, but the body and uh, the general appearance of the vehicle would be almost identical to what was in existence. Uh, I would also think that one of the best concepts that I can come up with, uh, and despite the fact that we have uh, three major rail gauges in Australia and some of the equipment is on one rail gauge but not on another. One of my ideas is um, uh, there's going to be the centenary in August of 2017 for the opening of this Trans-Australia line from Port Augusta to Kalgoorlie which is on standard gauge uh, and that's an, uh, virtually it was a nation building uh, project at the time and incidentally uh, for many people who have no idea about this um, in those early days, I think as early as 1913, uh, the Commonwealth Bank 
of Australia was formed and uh, at the time they just said, well, how much money do you need to uh, get this bank underway? Oh, and somebody named a figure of several hundred well, million pounds at the time and they just said, oh, well, we'll just print that money and put that in the bank and set up all your branches and uh, loan the money out, and which they did. And they actually made a profit at even a very low interest rate. I think it was less than 1%. Uh, was, these days, the interest rates would probably be close to that. So that's just getting off the subject a little bit. Uh, but it does. it is related in a sense that when they built the Trans-Australian Railway, they did so through uh, printed money. They just simply created the fi finance that was necessary, built the railway, and people think, oh yes, that causes inflation and that's, you know, you can't do that these days, and no, no, wouldn't get away with that. I beg to differ, and um, as late as the 1950s, uh, the Snowy Mountain Scheme in, in New South Wales, which is absolutely huge, uh, even by world standards, it's a large irrigation uh, dams scheme that uh, fed irrigation uh, uh, in um, south southeast sorry, southwestern New South Wales, really, what they call the Riverina. And that was done entirely through printed uh, money. But uh, it, it is related, as I say, to what I'm talking about. So the Trans-Australian Railway was open. And now, when the centenary comes in 2017, they'll have nothing uh, suitable to recreate a Trans-Australian train of the period. However, as I've suggested uh, in uh, a letter to um, the Railway Digest magazine in Sydney, and I uh, have had a similar comment published in the uh, newspaper here in Queensland, the Queensland Times, what could be done is a uh, set of cars that uh, exist, which were joint stock, wrong stock of New South, sorry, of Victoria and South Australia, joint stock cars of of the 1920s uh, to 30s, a period, um, they still exist. And also uh, um, the Yarra Park car, which was similar to vehicles that ran on the Trans Australian, is still very much in working order and still used on regular tours. Um, so it could be converted from broad gauge to standard gauge, as could those joint stock cars that I'm talking about. Now, they would go on to standard gauge and there'd be a, a locomotive. Uh, it certainly wouldn't be of the vintage the, of the opening of the Trans Australian, but as far as most people would be concerned, something like a Victorian Railways R Class could be utilised. Indeed, uh, the only one that would be suitable for such a, uh, a project or a series of projects or would be the R Class that was used on the. Uh, line from um, Melbourne to Warrnambool on the uh, West Coast Railway and uh, is oil fired. It was built in the 19, early 1950s uh, in Glasgow. Uh, the North British Locomotive Company built it, I think around 1951 or so. It was very, very late for steam locomotives to be constructed, incidentally. But that is still operational and could be done up as, uh, a, as a representative uh, of the steam era and successfully operated from uh, well not only of course Port Augusta to Kalgoorlie which would be the the idea in other words there'd be a, a commemorative train or trains there may be one going uh, towards the west and one coming east but that train and its set could be utilized to do any other standard gauge routes around Australia and I see the possibility of it uh, operating even to Darwin or out of Kalgoorlie, it could run to uh, Leonora and down to Esperance as well as to Perth, of course. So you would uh, not ignore that. So I think the tourism potential and the revenue potential, uh, you know, the popularity of that, that train would be immense. Uh, it'd make virtually um, world news in a sense because uh, no other railway that I'm aware of would ever attempt to do something like that and yet it would be quite viable you know, in a financial sense and a popularity and a, a public relations sense is, is almost without parallel. So people from the Great Southern Railway would have to get interested in this and involved in this before it's too late. 
we've only got a few years uh, and something ought to be done about it uh, well in time for that also i would uh, consider as i say that train set not only could it go to darwin but it come could come to sydney go up to brisbane down to melbourne and and uh, uh, across through to adelaide again it could be on standard gauge in fact for say a period of three years and uh, you know carrying out various rail tours over that time and on that subject uh, there is no reason why preserved rail motors for example from new south wales could not operate into victoria and operate around the standard gauge network and indeed uh, why uh, a broad gauge rail motor such as a derm which was diesel electric rail motor which was built in 1928 and one still exists and in good running order could be converted to standard gauge and operate in on the standard gauge system throughout uh, victoria new south wales and up to queensland so that could be done for also a period of three years um, it would create a situation where railway enthusiasts uh, and even the general public who are, have some interest in that type of thing or traveling on something of vintage standard and style and, uh, and, and a quality service uh, could be provided um, there's no reason why many rail tours could not be operated indeed uh, those rail tours could be, could be advertised in different rail journals such as trains magazine in the united states uh, because that rail motor has a uh, well that type of rail motor has a very direct connection with the united states in that uh, the first one, number 55, was built by the uh, St. Louis Car Company of St. in St. Louis, uh, Missouri. And then the other nine were constructed by the Victorian Railways to an identical design, basically, which were uh, actually uh, eight inches longer, but had uh, different bogies. Um, and those the cars, which were Winton gas engines, or petrol engines, as we call them in Australia, were converted over to... Uh, diesel electric and as i said uh, several of them are still in good working order and are available for any project along the lines that i've just suggested uh, and of course the uh, new south wales cph class rail motors got dating from the early 19 to mid 1920s actually um, 1923 i think was the first one so they exist and there's no reason why they couldn't be um, operated throughout Australia on the standard gauge uh, at various times and have a whole series of tours could be scheduled over time so in a sense these comments are not just to my friends who I will obviously uh, forward the, them to um, but they'll be uh, I hope uh, via YouTube for example uh, be picked up um, and considered in other words by organizations such as uh, rail preservation groups like in, in historical society like the ARHS in Victoria and New South Wales and also the ARE in Victoria may like to say well wait on this is this is a viable thing maybe we could do some of these things and maybe uh, by that uh, 2017 uh, 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 centenary of the trans we might see a train uh, uh, quite along the lines that I have um, suggested or I've envisaged so if we do see something like that you know that um, I've suggested it and, and I've discussed it uh, some years in advance so I'll just put those ideas uh, up and as, as I do with um, other concepts such as running uh, um, the vintage electric train sets which there's, there's one of four cars uh, in Melbourne uh, two what they call doggy box cars like dog box car electrics from the 1890s uh, uh, through to the two uh, uh, Tate cars from that 1918 uh, period, from the 1920s, in other words, and 30s when they were building them. They are available, uh, and, and they really ought to be running every weekend from Melbourne out to Belgrave, where they would connect with the Puff and Billy 2 foot 6 gauge steam train, uh, which is an extremely popular, uh, world renowned tourist uh, attraction. So I just put those ideas up as there are many others that could be discussed, uh, but I don't want to hold you for too long on this. So I just uh, would like to thank you for viewing. Bye now.